we're going to go ahead and start. Good morning. I'm Jeff Hammond, International uh, Ground Source Heat Pump Association. Welcome to our August Dig Deeper. Uh, we're thrilled to have Brock Yorty with us this morning uh, doing his presentation. And uh, thank you very much to Climate Control Group for being the sponsor of today's Dig Deeper. Climate Control Group is uh, Climate Master, Climate um, Climate Cool, and IEC Fan Coils. So thank you for that sponsorship. Before we get started with Brock, I'll just go through some updates so that you're familiar with what's going on with IGSPA. Sorry for the little glitch when we started. We should be recording now, and uh, this webinar will be available on the IGSPA website in the next couple of days. Just to go through some of the latest IGSPA news, We've been uh, lucky to have, whoops, uh, can I share that back, Brock? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm screwing everything up, everybody. No problem. Pardon me while we uh, have some technical difficulties here and, and we'll get back to- It's it's the driller. It's the driller just taking control when he shouldn't be <laughs> on a job site. Hey, that's great. We need the drillers taking control of the job site. So we'll, we'll take it, Brock. <laughs> I'll just go through a few of these these slides and then we'll turn it over to you. Everybody's looking forward to the presentation for sure. Um, we do thank everyone for the sponsorships. We still have one left for a Dig Deeper, our next Dig, dig Deeper, and we have two spots available for uh, the town halls. So as you saw the climate control logo, uh, your logo would be on that, uh, the intro slides. And what's great about that is this is a recorded session. So that stays uh, online for quite some time. If you haven't already signed up for the 2023 conference, the registration is ready to go. Just go to igspa.org. Also, we still have exhibitor spaces left and we still have sponsorships and advertising opportunities, but they are filling up quickly. December seems like a long way away, but it'll come quicker than we know it. So uh, make sure you're signed up for the conference and you have your exhibits ready or advertising. Um, all right. We would like to thank our sponsors for the conference. We certainly couldn't do it without our sponsors. You can see we've had great response. We only have two sponsorships left. There is a diamond sponsorship left for the conference, and there is one silver sponsorship left. Platinum, gold, and bronze are all taken. So uh, jump in quickly if, if uh, that's something that you're thinking about uh, before they're all gone. And, and we couldn't do it without the sponsors, so we certainly thank them. Uh, you can see uh, exhibit space is also filling up. Uh, we have a great location. The entry doors are right here on my right. And at the top is the NGWA space. So as those uh, doors open for the exhibit hall, you'll, you'll have a rush of people right through this door and through the top door here that's not shown on the, on the right-hand side. But it's a great location and uh, you'll want to uh, check that out here quickly. Program guide advertising I mentioned earlier, we have quarter, half, and full page is still available, plus the inside front cover and the back cover are available. And uh, that will be in the program guide that gets handed out at the conference with all of the speakers and, and so forth. The conference agenda is online. We have 11 tracks this year, 49 workshops, our annual general meeting, as well as a leadership address, a welcome reception, and we have a whole track with joint workshops uh, with NGWA. In fact, uh, Brock, I think, has two of those. We're thrilled to have a keynote speaker from the Department of Energy. It's Alejandro Moreno, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And uh, he will be our, our keynote this year. So a lot of exciting topics. That's, that's in December. Uh, next year, we have the IGSPA Research Conference in Montreal. So if you're looking at participating in the research conference, we are accepting abstracts through September 18th, and then we'll notify those who are uh, ab abstracts are accepted and they'll be able to start uh, ex submitting papers. So it takes quite a long time to get ready for the, the research conference. And um, if, if you're looking to, to uh, submit an abstract, you wanna do that here pretty quickly. If you haven't been online yet, Lately, uh, igspa.org is a brand new website. We tried to make it a lot easier to use. The menus pop down a little differently. And so it's uh, it's gonna work easier for you. It's also mobile friendly and hopefully you'll like the look of it. You should be able to find things a lot easier. So go to igspa.org if you haven't been there in a while. 
We're thrilled to announce that Geo Outlook is back. We've been asked for this magazine uh, for quite some time. We're able to start that again with our September digital edition. We will have two of these per year. The next one after the September edition is in January. And then uh, eventually we will be going back to a quarterly magazine. So we're looking forward to um, uh, you know, the interest in Geo Outlook. And if you'd like to submit an article, uh, please uh, contact us. We also have a lot of space for advertising in, in the upcoming issues. It's full for the September issue, which is great. But in the future, there's uh, quite a bit of opportunity there to get your name out to um, Igspa members. One thing that's a little different about Geo Outlook is we are partnering with BNP Media. And so if you're a subscriber to the news, engineered systems, the driller, you're used to BNP Media and this next edition and future editions are going out to their subscriber base. So that we're really excited about working with BNP Media. It just gives us better exposure, more exposure, I should say, um, to uh, the rest of the HVAC and the, and the driller industry. So uh, the IGSPA name will be out there and your advertisements and, and articles as well. If you'd like CEUs for these town halls and dig deepers, please send a chat message. Make sure you include your name and your email address and we'll keep track of those for you. So send that in the chat as you, as you have an opportunity. We do have a new option. Uh, it's not just this live webinar, but if you'd like to watch the recorded session later on, all you have to do is uh, mention this code, this DD2308 LPM. You don't need it for today if you're viewing this live, but if um, someone wants to watch these recorded sessions, they still get credits as long as they submit that code. Just a little bit of housekeeping. If you would, please submit your questions in the chat. I will read those at the end of Brock's presentation and then any of them that we don't get to, we will follow up later on. If you would, please mute your microphone unless you're speaking. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be recording this session so that you can view it later on. All right, one more slide and we'll turn it over to Brock. This is a disclaimer and potential conflict of interest statement. The upcoming presentation represents the opinion of the presenter and does not represent any official position, opinion, or endorsement of any products or services by IGSPA or its members. IGSPA town halls and dig deeper webinars are for member updates and education on the latest information in the geothermal heat pump industry and, industry and are not meant to endorse one technology or brand over another. It is the presenter's responsibility to disclose any conflict of interest or position that may arise in the content of the webinar. With that, I'm thrilled to uh, turn this over to Brock. I'll read your bio. Feel free to uh, share your screen whenever it's conven convenient for you, Brock. As I mentioned, Brock, you already is our speaker today. The desire to experience every drilling condition and drilling method is what drove Brock to volunteer for challenging drilling projects around the world. Brock has been very fortunate to be mentored and work alongside the very best men and women at Bayroid IDP, Labie Corp, Jeffco, the United States Military, Department of Labor, large mining companies, and drilling companies. He has treated all of this experience like a graduate school of industrial drilling. Brock is the global drilling subject matter expert and driller for the United States Military. He also teaches drilling for the Department of Labor and Western Michigan University. Brock has collaborated on geothermal projects throughout North America and Europe including phase one of Ball State University, NASA, Maryland, various state, federal, U.S. military buildings, and with Midwest Geothermal from 2018 to 2019. Brock is an active trainer, consultant, and construction industry media content creator with Ask Brock video blog series, DrillerCast podcast, Mudmen podcast, Drilling Insight podcast, and lead writer for the Driller magazine. It's my pleasure to, to uh, introduce Brock Yorty and, and uh, turn the presentation over to him. Thanks again, Brock, for joining us today. Uh, Brock, you're muted. <laughs> the, the, the number one uh, comment, I think, in a, in a Zoom meeting. Uh, yeah, you know, it's not like we've been doing these for a long time now. Uh, Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Ixba. Thanks, everybody, for joining. It's always weird to hear your, your bio read out. And uh, when you write those, you're like, I need to write a statement of qualification that'll 
makes me credible to give a presentation. And then it gets read out instead of, hey, I'm Brock. I'm a huge advocate of this industry and I love everything we're doing right now and uh, our goals for net zero. And uh, my, there we go. So here's my bio again. We don't really need to get into it other than I'm a proud father and uh, my wife hates it when I put trophy husband up there. But, you know, who is it a trophy husband that talks about drilling and subsurfaces and ground source geothermal? That's like the most exciting things we can talk about, right? So course objectives. Uh, I'm going to do an overview of the U.S. workforce compared to the construction employment. I'm going to talk about recruiting new workforce. I'm going to talk about our identifying ideal candidates for all of ground source geothermal projects, not just drilling. And then I'm going to talk about the training and culture and how we inspire and retain this next generation. So this is our employment playing field right now. You know, almost 162 million Americans are employed. 5,247,000 unemployed seeking work. Uh, there's 9 million job openings right now. It's, it's wild. Uh, the average pay is $27, $28 an hour and an average salary about 60 grand. If you notice, we look at this great chart. Uh, it's, I didn't even have to fade this photo out. It's like, as we get to the construction industry, those individuals are just kind of not in the spotlight like the doctor or the lawyer or the industry uh, business professional or whatnot. And what's up with that? Well, it's, uh, it's our demographics. It's not so much the fact that we've taken trade schools away or shop class, but when we really look at it, and I think as the construction industry, we're very proud of what we do, but we're very important, but we're not that big. And as we look at the construction employment field, you know, last year it was 7.6. So we rose 300,000 to 7.9 million employees that generate $1.5 trillion worth of business annually. That's amazing. Especially when we look, 20% of that is just overhead people, those management, business professionals, finance, operation. The doers are out there really performing about $300,000, $325,000 per person. So if we look at 2022, and as I discuss these things with the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's funny, you say you're a journalist for a drilling magazine, and that's credible enough to have people want to talk to you on the phone and have those discussions, but they there's so much great information they want to share, and I have some great things I want to talk about today. Uh, our demographics are wild, you know, so 1.5 million left last year. That's not as big as what happened as our... Uh, economic downturn, and we'll get into that. But another big piece and why we see the Department of Labor, the USDA for uh, water professionals, and the Department of Energy for you know geothermal and green job professionals, one in five construction workers are older than 55. And one in four drillers are over the age of 58. Meaning by 2030, 45% of our workforce is going to flip. We, uh, we have a hard time breaking uh, better diversity here with 94% men, 6% women. 25% uh, of our workforce in construction are foreign born, but US citizens. Highest paid construction jobs. It's pretty easy to see electricians, plumbers, pipe fitters, carpenters. Why? We still have trade schools. We have uh, formal SOPs. We have standards. It's, uh, it's something that everybody sees every day in their home. Like I said, 161 million Americans work for an average pay of $27, $28 an hour with reliable hours of operation. This is something we're going to see more from the Department of Labor and the Bureau of Labor Statistics coming out with. But let's face it, our complex construction jobs, field labor, farm labor with extreme weather is changing those reliable hours of operations. We already work because we're understaffed a lot more hours a week than say a normal 40 hour work week, overtime, whatnot. And now we're seeing extreme weather. Just last night in Grand Rapids, Michigan through Detroit, we had some pretty severe tornadoes and storms come through that we had very little notice for. We knew we were hot, but they popped out of nowhere and they, uh, they did some pretty big damage. And we see this from a hurricane 
you know, tropical storm that just hit, you know, Southern California to the wildfires in Canada. And there's a lot going on there that is impacting how we work. And so if you can go to a nine to five factory job or eight to five, and you got a roof over your head, that's much different. It's something we have to consider, especially when we see the median construction pay is $22 an hour. And we have lots of ways that our extreme heat to polar vortexes, many ways that we impact our job sites. Our unemployment rate is about 3.4% for the country right now. So we said 7.9 million workers in construction. 162 million working every day just in jobs. Then it gets wild when we think 1.2 million workers operate in an industry that requires drilling. I really believe that number's bigger because uh, my drilling ego says that everything has a drilling process before we start. We discover the unknown. We need that geotechnical investigation data. We need that water. We need that, uh, you know, heat source that we're going to harness by using the ground. But this is the numbers they give us. So then we look at uh, construction and extraction operations as we drill in, dig deeper into the workforce, and it's 473,000 Americans. And that breaks out to about 118,000 working in oil and gas drilling operations with 900,000 total working in oil and gas. Those numbers I think may be a little skewed from the science end of it and the petroleum engineering end of it, but that's what I keep coming across. And then the same, there's 573,000 miners working right now, but only 187,000 are in some sort of drilling operation. That leaves the rest of about 260,000 that are operating some sort of piece of equipment, construction operators that have a mast, have a derrick, have drilling operations. So when we go beyond our our big bridges and large holes, uh, cell phone towers, those type of things that are happening, we have about a quarter percent of this number. So roughly 19,000 water well drillers, geothermal drillers, cathodic, geotechnical, environmental in our country. We're also not the best at reporting our tribal self-taught industry. So that could be more, that could be less. So why do we have a quarter percent of that, you know, 1.2 million to the 473,000? Oil and gas have good training and onboarding benefits, expectations, safety protocols. Same with mining. The operating engineers, when we get into organized union work, you have benefits again. You have prevailing wage jobs. It uh, it really changes that dynamic from that $22 an hour to working at Chick-fil-A and having Sundays off and uh, knowing that you're making a wage with benefits. So it puts us right into wh- how are we going to recruit if we know that right now our workforce is only 19,000 when it comes to individuals that impact drilling field operations for this. We start with looking at our graduating class. And as I've worked on some workforce development things, uh, a big piece when we look at the rest of the skilled trade industry is shops, shop classes are back. We have technical schools, we have recruitment processes, and we're a little bit behind when it comes to how awesome it is to get to be part of a ground source geothermal project, uh, heat pumps, everything that's there. So we look at class of 2023, we had 3,300,000 high school graduates with a dropout rate below 6%. And that's a big key to where our construction workforce has gone. 86% of high school graduates feel pressured to get a four-year degree. Why? Reliability. Because we saw In the economic downturn, the housing crash, 60% of the construction industry left and went to other trades, went to other industries, started putting up satellite dishes, cell phone industry. We've also seen a massive increase in technology. There's a whole lot of really exciting jobs to uh, us sprinting to come up with a viable vaccine that's 
slowed and halted a, a global pandemic. You know, their parents learned the hard way. You know, technical classes and funding cuts started in 2010. And in 2010, we still had almost 11 million individuals working in the construction industry. Uh, Gen Z, they want to build their own way. They, they see the climate crisis happening right now. They want to have purpose. They didn't grow up getting muddy. They grew up with a screen in their hand. And we have a culture issue with this, but they've had information at hand. But as I grew up getting muddy and uh, wanting to become a mud engineer and a driller and those things, I ended up going to college as the housing market slowed down in Michigan first because that's where the technology was. Now technology is at their hands. They want to go out and get muddy and have purpose. And it's something we need to start thinking about in our hearts and how we harness this. So 50% of all high school students right now believe they can be successful without that four-year degree. That comes back to having the right trade schools, the training, the recruitment, um, these centers of excellences that we keep hearing and promoting and all the great things we can do in this industry. But their parents went to college. Uh, they want to learn the skills to be successful. And at the end of the day, when it comes to extreme weather, economic downturns and stuff, it's been proven day in and day out that uh, degreed workers with a 40-hour work week are less likely to be un unemployed and hold a medium pay of $55,000 a year annually, which is really hard to think about as we see inflation and uh, interest rates going up again, how that is a family-sustaining wage. So here we go. Here's 100 years of these damn kids can't work, right? Uh, so what... What do we see in the trades industry, in construction, especially in drilling, oil and gas mining, all of it? Uh, they're all overeducated with pointless degrees in uh, video game management and uh, swim, swimming pool 101. That's not true. Uh, they all want to be management in the first six months. No, they want milestones. They have ideas. They've also had technology in front of them, and they, they can see numbers and start rationalizing where things should go. We need to harness that and define their expectations. They're too busy watching, not doing. Yeah, they've had a screen in their head, but why don't we put that watching to use You know, in their professional development? How do we get them? So we have this 100 years of not wanting to work. Why? Here's the drilling generations. Uh, bottom right-hand corner, you can see my daughter with uh, my hydrogeological field camp defining soil samples. I got the U.S. military, with the steel workers. And my father up at the top left, that is a water well he drilled for the cemetery he's buried in. He died two years ago this Sunday from COVID Delta. And uh, why? Because we're a rough, tough industry and we don't take science serious enough. But you can see how our generations work and how our multi-generational groups are going to have to work with this whole new workforce that we have coming in, because we have to, 45% is going to be retired by 2030. So if I look at, from me being one of the youngest Gen X, 1980, to my wife and my great friends that are millennials, what happened in our generation versus the greatest generation going to the moon to uh, the boomer generation building our country and our economy and all of the milestones that we've made. What did we experience? We experienced a lot of technology fast from video games being pretty, you know, right there in our face, augmented reality. You know, that was what slowed down wanting to be outdoors to uh, VCR recordings to DVR, our patients. We instant, instant, instant. Cable TV, local was no longer important. You know, the video killed the radio star. Uh, blogging online became big. You know, local newspapers, how hard is it to get a print newspaper these days? Online shopping, you know, again, small businesses. What do our malls look like today? And then everyone went to college. Why? There was a lot of pieces moving from 9-11 to the economic downturn that said you needed to have a more diversified education. So if I look at that, before the oldest of Gen X, 
1992 to 96 was our highest dropout rate for high schools. We had the strongest construction and trade workforce at the time. Why? Because you could go learn the trades and you could be in it. And uh, that was important for some individuals. And we actively worked to engage high school students in a different level. And somehow we lost shop class in the middle of that and some of those important points. But you have to think about high school shifted to a prep to go to higher learning. Before the downturn, we had no problem hiring millennials and thinking about this is the work we're going to do. But parents, their parents in the middle of being uh, in their career, looking at how they'll be loyal and retire before this great resignation, we displaced 60% of them. The internet shifted recruitment and desirable jobs. On top of that, we had the war on terror for two decades where we had plenty of great individuals that liked being busy with their hands, liked the purpose, liked seeing results of something built, they went and fought for our country. In the middle of that, we have our uh, high school dropouts who have now built their career and our you know, middle management, field management foremans that don't have high school degrees. You know, So we had this war on knowledge. Oh, so, so you learn that in a book, it must mean it's right. Now you need to learn it for real. We got to have that balance. You know, the reality is millennials and Gen Zs watch their parents struggle. The millennials we have in this industry right now, we need to ask them, why? Why are you here? What inspired you? And that needs to be our elevator pitch. So what do we do for today's recruitment processes? We got our social media. We got our online hiring websites. We got job fairs, technical schools, college interns, and veterans. We talk a ton about veterans. I work with the United States Red Horse Combat Engineers for water well drilling and then the Army National Guard water well drillers, both running equipment that can be used in ground source geothermal, running heavy equipment like having purpose. But we miss a big piece every time we talk about let's hire veterans, and that's what do the veterans need from us? We got 19 million veterans in the workforce right now with about 15% of them working for construction. But we seem to quickly forget 65% of all Gulf War era two veterans, that's that 20 years, have some sort of lifelong impact from deployment. This was a nasty war. We, uh, we built equipment that made it so that we could survive uh, improvised explosive devices but we didn't talk about the shock and the impact to you know, PTSD to concussions and all of the rest of the things that went wrong. You know, 47% deployed Iraq, Afghanistan are likely suffering from PTSD and not seeking medical attention. And I'm gonna take a quick step back just because I have so many great industry friends and I know we all have friends and family and colleagues, but with this PTSD and what we see 20 veterans a day taking their lives, you know, there's the 988 counseling crisis line. The second number of most uh, individuals for suicide rate is the construction industry. And we're 7.9 million people. So mental health and all in the construction industry isn't as good as we could. And that's not today's talk, but if we're going to bring veterans upon who can be great leaders and help us push this process, we saw Governor Hochul with uh, the Skill Bridge program and uh, semiconductors for the state of New York. We're getting more involved, but that helmets to hard hats is not just a quick step as grabbing a high school graduate. They both need individual attention in order to be successful. Uh, my buddy, Jake Fletcher, sent me this quote, and uh, he's right there watching the cuttings come out of the hole. He retired as a uh, captain in the United States Air Force. The willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive the veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their nation. And there's nothing more important than coming back and helping us save the planet and get to net zero and do what we need to do here in this great industry. So if I focus on Generation Z right now, they don't want to work. I don't believe it. And I've worked with a ton of them and I've trained a ton of them. This is what I see. 
yeah, they saw their parents struggle. They've seen a global pandemic. They're seeing extreme weather on multiple levels, and they want to do something about it. They grew up with every piece of information they needed at their fingertips, good information and bad. We talk about this watcher generation in Minecraft. It's a shame that ICSPA, National Groundwater Association, the Construction Building Association, has not gotten to Minecraft and said, hey, why don't we have a GeoLoop field design, a building design program? Because my son plays it right now, and he's got a farm, and he's got a house, and I go, where does the well go? Where does the septic go? All right, let's look for our loop field. And he's five. It's planning. It's planning on a level that we should be inspiring using. It's new generation. You know, when we have that polar vortex and that big snow come through, I text my neighbor because I have a five and a seven-year-old and my wife, uh, Chelsea, is very busy when I'm traveling and gallivanting, doing whatever with New York Geo, Ixpa, whatever. Uh, I text him and I go, hey, can you shovel my sidewalk and he goes yep here's my venmo it's that easy they're a creation generation from minecraft to tiktok to social media to social awareness they like building processes processes have been a part of technology to them from coding we have bad standard operating procedures and we have that new individual that's excited and they're watching why don't we take that moment not put them in the danger zone and have them start documenting our sops so much innovation here, and they can quickly adopt it faster than any of us. The USDA had a study come out about groundwater professionals, and this is water, wastewater, water well drillers. They need 100,000 professionals by 2030 to refill the pipeline and science, everything. They've also realized if we're not talking to these students in elementary school, if we're not putting them in the middle of science classes. This is my daughter, again, sitting in for the hydrogeological field camp. She's going to be a hydrogeologist or a unicorn. She hasn't decided yet. I'm hoping for the hydrogeologist. Be cool, though, to not, I guess, own what's terrible. But you know, it'd be great to also have a daughter that's a unicorn. But we need to think about how we influence this generation. We got to do touch a truck at an elementary school. We need career days. You know what? National Groundwater Association has an awesome aquifer program. And I challenge this industry right now to come up with how we have a awesome loop field program or something that we can show that is either virtual or is something in a classroom that can show them how important it is to have ground source heat pumps. We need to be visiting them. We, we need to be talking about this on the street. We, I get into an elevator and I see a group of college students. And I go, what are you guys studying? Why? You should be part of the ground source geothermal industry right now. And this is why. This is Ask Barack. I'm Barack Yorty, and this is Bo Yorty, my five-year-old son. What did you see yesterday in our front yard? Um, there were, there were like, that had like a pair of tractor, and then like, he didn't have shorts and boots on, and he could have got very hurt without two people, and guess what? He almost got hurt. So there you go. It's summer break. We got little eyes everywhere watching all of this urban infrastructure work we have going on. We had a utility contractor in our front yard pulling back after they drilled out some utility lines. What did you catch them doing first? What were they digging up? Our gas line. Why? So we wouldn't hit it. Was that smart? Yes. But then they didn't have gloves and steel toed boots on. Well, that was the only smart thing they did. That was the only smart thing they did. So, see, there you go. We can inspire the next generation. And this five year old gets it. And, you know, I get these uh, drillers that go, Brock, we can't just break everything down into a whiteboard and give everybody the standard operating procedure. It's not a classroom, this is the real world. Exactly. We get to decide how this industry is perceived and we can be construction professionals 
or we can be shade tree mechanics. Was it hot yesterday? Yes. Did they have water? No. Do you think that was safe? No. Why? Because if they didn't have water, they couldn't survive out there with us. Do you want to work a job in the sun with no water? No. See, it's that simple. Everybody be safe out there. Sorry about that. So I hope you can all hear that. Uh, we have little eyes watching our industry. My son did that in one take. We we were sitting on the front porch. I wanted him to see the construction project happening, and I was home. And he was very concerned about the safety, you know? And so our culture, we need to understand, we represent everything that happens on our job sites and what the next generation, as those school buses drive by, as those kids walk by the fence, other individuals, we have an opportunity to show all the great things we're doing or all the really poor things we're doing. And that leads into what is our ideal candidates looking like? You know, post COVID, or, you know, pre COVID, you know, long haired, freaky people need not apply. Our culture's got to shift. We have individuals that are inspired, and this is who they are, and we need to train them. So let's recruit into the clean energy sector, you know, coming from the US Energy Employment Report. There are 300,000 new jobs in the energy sector. 17% of our green workforce is older than 55 years old. What's wild is 30% is under 30. They want to be there. You can see this. 9% are veterans. It's 114,000 new green jobs posted. How do those break out when we look at beyond vehicles and EV and sustainability manager? When we get into us, 12,000 for solar, 5,000 for wind, 1,000 for geothermal. And the question is, is that hot rock or is that ground source? How are we reporting that? The LinkedIn Green Skills Report said there's a concentration on green talent increase from 7 to 13% in 2023. And the top skills added in the past three years have been renewable, solar, power distribution, Almost every individual that's building a LinkedIn profile is talking about sustainability. Those are our candidates. When I get into the field, because let's face it, weather is extreme. It's muddy. Drilling's tough. Manifolding's tough. Fusing. When we get out into it, it takes a special individual that wants to be there and that enjoys that. Patrick Leccioni has a great book called The Ideal Team Player, and he talks about the humble, hungry, and smart principles. And we need to look at, we want humble. That's a little ego. And that's, that's tough for us drillers. It's big. But how do we change that culture? You know, focusing more on their teammates than themselves. That's how we have better safety culture. That's how we have better SOPs. That's how we have well-trained people. They have to be hungry. Strong work of that thing because it's tough, but they got to be paid well for that hungry, star, strong work ethic. You know, they want to contribute. They want to get muddy. And then finally, smart doesn't have to be intellectually smart, but just the ability to read and look at soft skills versus, you know, hard skills. And this new generation, as we look at what soft skills and hard skills is, and I won't get into it today, I have a great article on it. Gen Z, the youngest of millennials, they have blended that from coding to creation, and we need to harness that. Expectations for the field. What does it look like for us? Hours of operation. Again, uh, we talk about what it's going to cost to do these projects, and we look at skilled laborers. And yeah, they make 22 bucks an hour, but they can work all the hours they want. Last two and a half years has taught us that, you know, uh, quality of life is at the end of the week, being able to enjoy what we've done for that week. If we're burned out by Wednesday afternoon and sore, what are we gaining? What do the working conditions look like? It's got to be muddy. It's got to be dirty. It's got to be hot. How can we help at that from our PPE 
to having ice cold bottles of water instead of a giant jug of water and dirty cups. There's a lot of things. Travel expectations. We need drillers. I, we could send every driller we have right now to the state of New York. And I know Christine and Scott are going, heck yeah, get them there right now. But if that great drilling company comes from Colorado, what is the expectations of that travel? When do they get back? We talk about this as a young individual game. The joke is, is we want their unbroken back and we want their non-commitment and excitement for adventure. Why is it every time we have an individual that falls in love, starts a family, they end up at an eight to five in a factory with good insurance? We have to think about that. And then obviously skill expectations from how we advocate for CDL drivers to how we move this equipment, how our industry talks to the, the transportation industry on what a CDL looks like for us versus them. Look what NGWA is doing. What are our trade expectations? We have these great ideas and workforce development. We're going to see these awesome schools come out, but we have to understand how they fit the region and not the country. How does our collaboration work? You know, there's a lot of culture on, you know, I am supervisor. That means I'm going to point how it's done. I'm not going to be in the hole with you. You know, we need people that are leading by doing. What do those milestones look like? How long? What, if I get my CDL, what does that look like for a raise? There's many pieces there that are very important for us to be able to keep and retain this industry. And we can see it. There's 9 million jobs out there. And that's not focusing on what we need. What is our succession planning? So for me, these 21st century new hires, and you know, as we went through uh, my, my goofy uh, statement of qualification, I worked for Veolia North America and Suez North America as director of wells for drilling for the Southeast of the rest of the country and had lots of individuals that worked for me that were drillers, that were scientists, that were salesmen, you know, and we just have an issue of simulating new people into an industry that weren't born into it or don't understand the trades because mom and dad went off and became accountants and lawyers and whatnot. We got to get past that. So we have to create opportunities for collaboration with a new diverse workforce. And that's what we're going to see with Justice 40 and everything we're doing. We're going to have a completely different looking workforce that our culture is important. So first and foremost, information is at their fingertips. We can't assume that they're not already researching how their job or looking at Glassdoor or on YouTube, looking at the processes to learn. If they ask questions about innovation or a new set of eyes, we need to hone in on what's made our company great and also what, why not? Why can't we try this? What are those alternative solutions? What are their special skill sets and how can we inspire and enable them? Because of the next piece of this, as I can, I can feel it hitting my brain right now, Brock, we bring in a bunch of these young kids. This is what happens. They're there six weeks and they're gone. What is it costing you in six weeks to onboard them for them to leave? That's a balance that we need to know and stuff. It's great to watch Gary Vaynerchuk go, you know what? I spent six months looking at candidates. I found the right candidate. I interviewed him for another two and a half months. Two days into the job, I fired him. And it was the right operational thing to do. I'm sure that story's got a heck of a lot more to it. But we're a quarter of a percent of a behemoth of a workforce that we need more. So what can they teach us? What skills do they have? How can we build upon them? Let's overcome those weaknesses. Ergonomics, I'm going to show a safety slide in a moment. We really need to think about repetitive stress and how we make this industry smarter, not harder. And then again, that comes right into SMART. What can they do for us that's different from the way they understand spreadsheets to SMART apps, to communication, to making good decisions? Employee expectations. Our industry needs a family sustaining wage. And I know right now we're talking a lot about the economics of drilling and ground source geothermal, but if we can't figure out what a family sustaining wage is from union to non-union, we're going to be in big trouble. They also want a safe place to work. 
And that means so many things, starting from me being an OSHA authorized trainer, working on my safety credentials, you know, what safety processes do we have in place? OSHA is enforcing some wild things with 39 men killed last year in trench collapses. This is a big deal, but also a safe place to work from diversity to inclusion to how we lead, how we discuss with this industry. What is our onboarding and training plan? Do you have company SOPs? What is your standard operating procedures that made your company the size it is today and made it successful? We've been really good at using our hands. We've been really bad at writing things down. What do those milestones look like? What does our field leadership look like? Because again, a, an excited employee that's been with us six weeks, we should start trading like that unicorn. We have to engage at all levels from older senior leadership down to the assistants working together. Lost time injuries in construction right now, struck by, caught in an object, 53%. How does that happen? Uh, Brock, it was one in a million. I've investigated a ton. What does it come down to? It comes down to bad processes, unsafe acts, which is 80% of all of these injuries. On top of that, I want you to see that overexertion yellow one. You jump online right now and you say, my shoulder hurts. I have repetitive stress injury from swinging pipe wrenches like an idiot. I have great friends that have, you know, fused backs from picking up pipe and concrete, overexertion will overtake one of these other two or will become a larger majority due to us not working smarter, being that we uh, we think it's the ESPN, the Ocho, and we all grab two bags of Portland cement and one bag of graphite to run it over to the, the grouting machine or however that process. We need to really think about that because as I sit down on a Friday afternoon, I'm like, my shoulder really hurts and I start Googling things, I get this great WebMD deal that at the bottom, it says, Hammer and Schuster and Law, we'll get you paid for your repetitive stress injury. It's going to impact our bottom line. Our new workforce, this is mind-blowing, and it's, uh, it's something up there that I think we all have to talk about as we build centers of excellences and we bring in this more diverse workforce that doesn't look like today's construction workforce. You know. Unions employ, employers have formal diversity, equity, and inclusion, and access plans to increase hiring and retention of diverse workforces at a higher rate than non-union employers. We can change that. We need union, we need non-union, but we have to think about our workforce is changing. Union employers are 50% more likely to have a policy to recruit women, two times more likely to have a policy to recruit persons of color, two and a half times more likely to have a policy to recruit LGBTQ plus people. If we're going to be successful and get all the ground source geothermal we want in this industry in, this is not going to be my grandfather's construction workforce. My grandfather was a loving, wonderful man. I'm just saying we're changing how this is going to look. And I know this is shaking and you're why is this our discussion today, Brock? Because we don't have the difficult discussion. We're not going to be successful. So developing field personnel, and we had a we had a pretty big intro. So I uh, I'm hoping I get 15 minutes since uh, uh, we had a little bit time in the beginning. But if we think about drilling specifically, field work, drillers, drilling companies, engineers, HVAC contractors, scientists out there, we are discovering the unknown together. I'm too fat to be an astronaut but I could still discover the unknown on the back of a drill rig. There's lots that happen there. We have to think about that. Therefore, we are harnessing the subsurface together. Our traditional training from tribalism, it's experiences what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. We need to think about how we share that knowledge. We need to define those standard operating procedures, that job safety analysis, how we use continuing education credits. And then my favorite site hazard identification and tactics. My acronym there, SHIT, because that's what happens when we don't do those right. What does our coach mentor look like? How do we develop these ideal team players? 
And uh, Walt Whitman, my favorite quote with a, a construction worker that's a unicorn, re-examine all you've been told, dismiss what insults your soul. We can do this industry. What does our mentor coach look like? They're ageless. If we can start this right now where Gen Z coming in can share how drones work, can share how we can get paperwork done faster, can share things they've seen, we're going to have a better industry. We need to figure out who those coach, those mentors, those trainers look like. We got to share knowledge without fear. 2030, we're, you know, seven years away, six and a half years away from having an entire generation of great knowledge retired. Uh, we need to include the students in discussions. I had a great mentor. I was working a project. I was in a remote location. I spoke Paquito Spanish. I'm talking to my, my mentor on the phone. He gave me a plan. I laid it out. Three days later, I called him back on the satellite phone and I said, it's working. And he goes, what do you mean? You did it exactly the way I told you to. It worked. You know, and uh, I had this moment. Oh, no. And he goes, I'm just kidding with you, kid. That was exactly what we needed to do. Good job. That gave me a win. That, that built the next 10 years of my career and understanding how we needed to share knowledge. It's got to be mutual. What do our ideal teachers look like? From the field standpoint, it doesn't have to be our best operator. It has to be one with patience that understands what a project execution and success looks like. Do we have time to train? You know, if we're going to have these training programs that are a blend between centers of excellences and field work, we got to choose the right fields that have good drilling conditions that are muscle memory, something that we can continue to build upon. The same as our standard operating procedures on how this hole is designed and how we manifold. If we're going to build a large workforce, you know, we have to optimize that success. Training programs from stocking caps to cowboy hats, the drilling industry has some of the craziest different looking, you know, uh, terminology. And we have to pull the curtain back as the drilling industry, as the field on how that looks. I have lost the, there we go. So, this is one of my favorite slides, you know, tribal training versus formal training center. Michael Bay and Armageddon with Bruce Willis has broken our ego on a, on a scale that is almost irreparable. And it comes down to, uh, it was easier to teach drillers to be astronauts than it was to teach astronauts to be drillers. And uh, we live by that motto now, and we don't have to. You know, drilling is about knowledge, experiencing knowledge. How do we get there? There's multiple ways in the field that we train. How is that successful execution done? What does our leadership look like? Now, let's translate that into Fleming College or Western Michigan University, the United States military or whatnot. We suddenly go to a Tommy Boy scenario. How, how is it going to look today versus next week? And what are all that we need to know? We, ne we need to know the science and the fundamentals, the project specifications how physics is applied, what our applications are going to look like, how do we execute safely and efficiently, what Excuse are the me. goals? Excuse yes. me, Brock, can you, can you reshare your screen? I, I think we lost your uh, video feed. Okay, that would be why things got weird. How's that? There we go. Great, thank you. All right, so yeah, now you see Billy Bob, you see, uh, you know, uh, Farley, and I don't sound like an idiot, so... We'll move on, but these are the things that we need to understand. And how do we get there? You know, this is what we have for training new hires for drilling right now. There's also the Art of Water Wells by Marvin Glockfelty. But what is our form? What are we going to use for that resource book? Because, you know, we see plenty of presentations and slides that say, this is the book. This is how much information's in it, but really it should be five times thicker or you guys don't really know what it is or it's outdated. And so what do we go with for knowledge sharing? Our Dr. Seuss application, right? This is not acceptable on how we're going to get there. 
though this is what can happen when we take classically trained in a academic atmosphere and send them to the field with the wrong culture. Anyone can drill, right? Inter introduction to drilling real quick. This is what I need. I need open, stable, straight, clean. I need product that goes in and I need to have an efficient resource extracted out of it. How do I do it? I rotate a bit. There's feed pressure that's exerted. There's weight. Fluid is pumped, moves the cuttings up hole. It's that simple. I'm trying to keep a cutting intact from bit face to surface so that I have a hole. And I'm doing that through energy and velocity. You can see at the top, that's traditional mud rotary. You can see next we have air. Air is great, but air with great power comes great responsibility, competent formations. We have foam, we have specialty foams. These are all things that can be discussed along with sonic and direct push and everything else out there. It's gotta be the right tool for the right application as we're training. The big piece, I'm overcoming gravity. And uh, like I said earlier, I'm too fat to be an astronaut, but I still uh, I have admired everything that NASA's done and I'm happy to see it coming back. You know, in order for us to get that stuff out of the hole, we have to understand the fundamentals and the physics to do it. So what training resources do we have? We have IGSPA. We have this right here. We have the discussions. We have what's happening around the country. We have to be that body that is doing this. We have water well drillers we need to bring in. We need to be able to have an industry standard criteria for these fundamental methods. You know, I, I love everything that's happening in New York. Thank you, New York Geo. Thank you, NYSERDA. You're blazing the way for us. Illinois Geothermal, great education. Love it. And I know there's many other states out there doing great things. We got to incorporate OSHA. The Driller has great resources. NGWA has fantastic fundamentals. We just need to align how they work with drilling a water well versus geothermal. And they both have similar fundamentals. It's a good place to start. We have podcasts. We have professional development events. We have plenty of ways how we can do this leading into what our centers of excellence could look like one day. This is what I've learned from training the military since 2009. They're safe because our stakes are so high that bringing in a Blackhawk from Bargroom is not an option to life flight somebody out. They're a clean slate because they joined and they're there. They're fully engaged because this is their only job. They Deployment is all that matters because water is what matters for these fobs. You know, uh, they're disciplined. They'll do anything I ask. Uh, they're focused on success. The mission is everything. And I see that, and it doesn't exactly blend right into how we train in the field for drilling. You know, uh, life lessons from in the field to classrooms to days to weeks, training sessions, you know, our safety. It's built on the company culture. It's uh, unsafe acts repeated until somebody gets really hurt. Are they fully engaged? Sometimes, sometimes they're not. What's the discipline? It's at the level of who the leadership is that's driving, understanding the fundamentals as much as understanding that sometimes we need that blunt force hammer to be successful. Uh, they'll try anything once. You know, they they get too muddy or something happens. Nah, that's not my job. Go get Bobby. You know, what are the stakes? Uh, we can finish this tomorrow. It's five o'clock somewhere. The mission is not everything. Quality of life is the mission. What does training a team for growth look like? We have lots of advances from rig technology to safety technology, ergonomics. There's lots there that can help us be better at training and how we work smarter, not harder. You know, we need a team that everybody trusts from the office to the field to be able to understand our process, especially in drilling. And it's built on project knowledge and successful execution, not wells from hell. One great thing we have is there's plenty of holes to be drilled. There's lots of good muscle memory. We should be able to dial these things in. You know, we have to create procedures for all elements. That can happen in the field. We start with the fundamentals and the standard operating procedures. 
we got to have safe, efficient projects and we have to have people that trust themselves. A change for everyone, this is what I see, design specifications. How are we going to start a center of excellence? Is it going to be like when I did my 11 months of oil and gas fluids and drill engineering training where I started in shallow hole and ended high pressure, high temperature? You know, we have to think about where, where are most people going? Is it going to be that small commercial project? Is it going to be residential homes? Or is it going to be a large scale, you know, production drilling project? What is our best method and practices for that region? What do the project tasks look like? What does the equipment look like? How are the ergonomics? How's the safety? Professional presence and incorporation of all the professionals of the field of a geothermal project is key. Leadership is key. Communication classes are going to be key. And then how do we complete these and how do we wrap it up? If I'm at an individual company, what am I looking at? Regional best practices, cost of operation and level of risk for that project. What are my leadership roles and responsibility? We got a driller, we got driller assistants, we got field technicians. There's nothing sexy about saying I'm a helper at 20 years old while I'm trying to meet the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. What do the well logs and regulations look like for our state, for our regions, how we're doing this? What are our tooling and rig specifications? What does that whole specification look like? What is the entire project specification? These are the things that when I'm asked, can I build a drilling company today? I'm a water well driller. I want to get into geothermal. I'm a geothermal driller and I want to scale up. These are what we talk about. And then finally, after action reviews, what was expected to happen today? What really happened? Why did it happen? How do I prevent it from happening again? Or it went really well. How do we approve upon this? We got to teach on good and bad experiences. We need our senior employees that have been classically trained in the field to know that it's important to prevent new hires from experiencing the same failure. Muscle memory and success is going to inspire people to stay. Giving a big shout out to Midwest Geothermal here. This was a project we did in the Chicago suburbs. And we talk about drilling being messy and we talk about what it's going to look like. That was not an expectation. And these two drillers were under 30 and we don't, as an industry enough, we see drill rigs out there, drill rigs leave, parking lots put back, buildings running efficiently, everybody's got their name on the, the wall, but you know what? Nobody says, hey, Tony, hey, Courtney, hey, Scott, great job on what you did before anybody even showed up. Retaining, what is the cost? What is our company co culture? Again, what is every week of onboarding and training worth to us? I've come up with a three by five. It's a five by three review that I use with my people. And I know we're running out of time. I just want to say retaining, engaging, and giving goals doesn't have to be some massive leadership book or anything. What I did at Suez and what I've done with many young drillers and individuals, I grab a three by five note card. I ask them to write down their five goals. I ask for one goal at the end of the month. And I do this after their very first week of work. I ask for two goals to be achieved in six months. And I ask for two goals to be achieved by the end of the year. Then I establish the three meeting dates. On the other side, I have already written my one month goal, my two for six months and two for the end of the year. And then I meet with them in a month. And if you think you've got a problem with everybody wanting to be in management, after that first month, you have that individual look at what their one month, six months, and year's goals were. And after they see the complexity of a project and what's everything's happening, they'll be humble. And you go, here's your new card. Go ahead. Give us your new goals. My goals stay the same. Safety, SOPs, CDL, competency, finding a better way to do something. And then we maintain those schedules. And I have an article on this, and you guys will have these slides. You can say, Brock, this is crazy, but it's simple and it's replicatable. And it was a good way to get a large group invested. Also, if I want to maintain my team, these are the questions that I've, I've been asking. And Simon, Brene Brown, 
you know, Patrick Lecce, there's plenty of folks out there that give this for us to be better professional developers as leaders. You know, I ask, do you enjoy your job? Do you feel safe? As leaders, we have to know what's unsafe on a job site from culture to operations. What do you want to learn next? More importantly, what do you want to do next? You know, that could be as much as I need to get a vehicle for my wife so she can get to college for nursing class more reliable because I'm on the job site at 630 and she's texting me and telling me it's overheating. These are the things we got to think about, you know, and again, we have plenty of ways how we can communicate. Thank you for your time today. I uh, I had pacing for an hour and Jeff uh, had, you know, so it went. I appreciate all of you that have stayed and uh, I welcome any discussion, comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brock. Uh, great presentation. We have a lot to learn uh, and appreciate your advice on uh, and how we can bring in Gen Z and maybe even some millennials and, and Gen X, you never know. Um, if you have time to stick around, uh, we do have a question. Um, Absolutely. You have time? Okay, great. Uh, That's a good question from Steve, and, and this is kind of the age-old question, but it, but it's uh, very timely. Um, Steve says, I read, an, artic I read an, an overview of a project to reduce the cost of geothermal heat pumps. The text claimed the greatest potential cost reduction was in the ground heat exchanger. Please comment on this, given that the industry needs to attract more loop contractors. So there's always that, uh, you know, how, how do we reduce costs when we need to hire these, uh, these individuals? And do you want to comment on that? Absolutely. Okay, so there's a couple pieces to this. Uh, obviously, I worked for Labe Corporation Versadrill, and we see a lot of Versadrills in the field. I helped develop their training program for the military. And when I was doing that in... 2010, 2011, rigs were five to 600,000. You know, we went through tier four emissions. We went through a lot of expectations. And today, those same rigs are now a million one. And so we have a big discussion about, well, first off, we got to find rigs that are affordable, innovative, and efficient at their job, reduce work. And it's, you know, it's that age old, age old do you want cheap, quick, or, uh, it's not cheap, quick, or fast. You want, uh, you know, good, cheap, or quick, and you can only pick two. And so we get into how do we bring in loop contractors when they have a lot of invested equipment? And there's many great companies on here right now that have done a good job of innovating, but it's at a company cost. And then we look at it, fuel. So if we just look at fuel to footage ratio, we're obviously looking at, getting more efficient. And I think that comes from specifications of projects and how we work together on the project design and the amount of time it's going to take to drill. And finally, many drilling companies, drillers are not paid what they are in the mining and uh, oil and gas industry or as a construction operator with a crane or a dozer. And so when you look at their aptitude and all of the microsecond decisions they have to make to be successful to drill a borehole from 300 to 500 to 800 or add at a degree, shout out to the Celsius guys, you know, what we need to do with what we're doing, I, I don't know if we can cut the amount of cost out that we want, especially just from a fuel to footage and a family sustaining wage. and so. The only other way is they organize and uh, we have prevailing wages and it gets built in and it's a different level to there. You throw in extreme weather and those guys sit in a hotel room or gals or individuals and they don't get paid that day that we have the rain out. So it's, uh, we got some things to overcome. I know we have some efficiencies and things we can do better, 100%. I know we can dial in our science and fundamentals over Brock, I just need to make hole today. And sometimes we have good days of drilling and bad days. We got a project that's going to be anything over 10 holes by hole number three in that grid area. I should be able to have a dialed in drilling program. And as I, I work for venture drilling supply, so obviously I business develop and I train. I have rigs that uh, I, I like and prefer. I'll say the best tool is the most readily available tool. But now we have to have expectation of time and cost.
Very good point. We get to get to sell the value, not uh, not keep trying to beat down the price. It sounds like so. That's great. Uh, very much appreciate your time, Brock. Thank you, everyone who has joined us for our August Dig Deeper. Thank you to, for uh, Climate Control Group for sponsoring this this Dig Deeper, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next one. Everybody have a great weekend. Thanks again. See ya. Thanks, everybody.